Hello and welcome to Probabilistic Machine Learning, lecture number 16. We began this course with the observation that probability theory is a tool to extend truth values from discrete values, true or false, to a continuum which allows us to distribute truth across a space of hypotheses and thereby extend propositional logic to reasoning under uncertainty. Already in lecture two, we noticed that this process comes at potentially high computational cost because it requires us to keep track not of just one single hypothesis which we deem true, but an entire potentially combinatorially large space of hypotheses which we have to simultaneously track and assign truth values to. And ever since then, the course has been about developing computational tools to deal with this computational complexity. We used Monte Carlo and Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to produce random numbers, samples, which allow us to compute approximately integrals and therefore expected values, marginals, evidences, over probability distributions in a discretized and approximate fashion. We um, then quickly realized that there is an extremely powerful framework called the Gaussian framework which is particularly amenable to settings in which the variables we reason about are linearly related to each other. If you assign Gaussian distributions to linearly related variables then all the inference boils down to linear algebra. And that framework it turned out is actually quite a powerful one which can be used to build learning machines, probabilistic learning machines for supervised problems. In particular, first for regression, so for learning functions that map from a general space to the real line. This can be done in a parameterized fashion and we saw that this is connected to the notion of deep learning. If you want to do maximum likelihood inference on the parameters, on the representation, on the features of this function. But it can also be extended to um, sort of in some sense sort of in the opposite fashion from a deep representation with finitely many degrees of freedom to an essentially infinite but wide representation that is associated with the notion of a Gaussian process and that provides a non-parametric in some sense infinite dimensional representation of unknown functions. We also saw apart from various interesting theoretical properties of these models that they um, can be extended to particular kinds of conditional independence, in particular for time series, and can be extended approximately to settings in which the observations aren't real valued, but they, are some, they can be seen as some kind of transformation of an underlying latent real valued function. This gave rise to first the notion of classification for binary outputs, multi-class classification for discrete outputs, and generalized linear models for functions that map from a general input domain to a relatively general output domain. To do so we already had to use some form of approximate inference, in particular the Laplace approximation. Now in the previous lecture we found yet another generalization of the Gaussian, actually not yet another, but a generalization of the Gaussian framework in a perhaps sort of surprising direction which provided a framework for learning probability distributions rather than functions. And this is connected to the notion of an exponential family, which in some sense is a parameterized representation of an, a, a family of probability distributions such that inference in these models is particularly computationally efficient. We can do maximum likelihood inference, maximum a posteriori inference, or even full Bayesian inference. Today, I'd like to return to the very beginning of the lecture course, lecture number two, what we observed there and then see how that the initial sort of simple observations we made there can be extended into a more general framework which we will then use for the rest of the course to build ever more powerful quite structured probabilistic models. So let's recap what we did in lecture number two. Back then I showed you an example from uh, a book by Judea Pearl. It uh, was a very simple example, uh, essentially a very low dimensional discrete inference problem that could be done without continuous variables. It's connected to a story about a guy who lives in a place that has both earthquakes and burglaries. 
and one day gets a call in his office that the alarm in his house is uh, ringing and now has to reason about whether that the cause for this alarm is an earthquake or a burglary or actually something else and then later gets information from the radio that there has actually been an earthquake and there then we discovered that this kind of observation has an interesting effect on the joint probability distribution over earthquake and burglary. Maybe the more fundamental insight back then was that um, the, this joint probability distributions over such a set of variables, so in this case there are four binary variables, have in general combinatorially many degrees of freedom. So if you have four variables, you could have 16 minus 1 degrees of freedom because the 16th uh, possible state has a probability that is given by 1 minus all the other states. And 15, of course, is not so much. But if you have more than four variables, then that number evidently quickly grows exponentially. Now, such probability distributions, joint probability distributions over four variables, A, E, B, and R, can generally, using the product rule of probability theory, be decomposed into terms that could be called generative terms, not causally generative, but in a probabilistic sense, generative terms, as the probability for the first variable, given all the other ones, times the second variable, given the two remaining ones, times the third variable, giving a final one, and times the, third, times the final variable. The order of variables in here doesn't matter. Every possible ordering of these variables allows such a factorization because it's a fundamental property of probability theory. However, there are certain factorizations, so certain representations of this joint distribution in terms of such a factorization, in which the representation becomes easier because you can use domain knowledge about the generative structure to reduce the computational complexity. We know that the probability for the alarm to ring doesn't depend on, the on announcements on the radio because it's caused actually by earthquake or burglary. We know that the probability for the radio to give an announcement has nothing to do with a burglary in the house of our house owner, but only with the earthquake. And that the probability for an earthquake to happen has nothing to do with burglaries taking place, at least under this model. Since that's true, that means that these individual terms become easier. The probability for the earthquake now consists just of a single number, the probability for that earthquake, rather than two numbers, the probability for that earthquake, if there is or there isn't a burglary. Therefore, such factorizations can potentially drastically reduce the number of degrees of freedom, the variables we have to keep track of, the number of states we have to simultaneously consider in our inference problem. At the same time, back then, I also introduced sort of more as a, like on the side, and today we'll spend a bit more time on it, this graphical representation of this problem, which is, back then, I said, it's called a directed graphical model or a Bayesian network, and it's a graphical representation of such, such generative structure that can be directly created from such a joint distribution. So if you have such a factorization, either this one or this one, in particular this one, then you can create such a graph by first checking the set of all, of all variables, here A, E, B, and R, creating one circle for each of such variables, then looking at the factorization, and for each term in the factorization, drawing an arrow from the right-hand side of the factor to the left-hand side of the factor. So here an arrow from E to R, and here arrows from E and B to A. And then finally, when we actually do inference, there's an additional sort of syntactic trick that we fill in all the variables that we get to observe that makes it easier for us to parse this graph. In lecture two, we already thought a little bit about these kind of directed graphs and what kind of structure they can represent. We did this relatively briefly, and today we'll spend more time on them. In particular, we observed that because of the product rule, because every joint probability distribution can be written in terms of these conditional distributions and the order of these variables doesn't matter, of course every joint probability distribution over a set of variables can be represented by such a directed acyclic graph, a directed graphical model, a Bayesian network.
However, because the order of these variables doesn't matter, the order of the direction of the arrows in such a graph also doesn't matter. And that means, I mean that and the fact that every joint probability distribution can be represented in this way, that this fact isn't particularly helpful. The fact that every probability distribution can be represented as a graph just means that this graphical representation is sort of powerful but to make it useful you have to find a factorization in which the graph isn't densely connected because only then does it actually encode conditional independence information that is useful for inference. We also noticed back then already quite quickly that this notion of directed isolated graphs or graphical models, directed graphical models, Bayesian networks, it has maybe some, some aspects that you might consider a conceptual flaw, which is in particular that not every conditional independence structure of a joint probability distribution can be jointly represented in a single graph. Back then I did an example, which is actually, I forgot to say back then, due to Stefan Hameling, who is at the, the University of uh, Düsseldorf, which uh, works like this. So there are two coins that we throw, each of which is fair, so it has 50% chance of landing heads or tail. And the, there's a, as a third object to a third variable C, there is a bell that gets rung whenever the two coins have parity, so whenever they show the same face heads or tail. This is the corresponding conditional independence table and we saw back then, I'm not going to redo the derivations, but we saw that um, these three, like this conditional uh, independence structure can be, oh sorry, this, this conditional probability table can be represented through three different factorizations because it has actually three different kinds of conditional independence or marginal independence. The probability for the first coin is independent of the other coin when you compute the marginal and integrate out C. The probability of the other coin is independent, the face of the other coin is independent of the face of the first coin when you marginalize out C. And the probability to hear a bell is actually independent of an individual coin if you marginalize out the other coin. At least that's true if both coins are fair if they're both 50% chance of uh, showing heads or tails and or tails. So these three different factorizations though they correspond to three different graphs and as we saw back then you can look at the video again if you want to these three different graphs each do not encode all three of these independent statements. So clearly these directed graphs although maybe helpful, maybe they are at least beautiful to look at, are not perfect. They are not encoding all conditional independent structures you might want to encode. So today I would like to return to this topic of directed graphical models. In lecture two we introduced them in a um, sort of very relatively ad hoc way because we needed to talk about conditional independence to understand the computational complexity so that then in the following lectures I could talk about conditional independence but I didn't actually formally really study these graphical models um, in any sort of detail so today we'll begin to do that and what we will do is First of all, in the next slide, I will introduce a little bit of extended syntax. I'll make this language of directed graphical models a little bit more expressive and powerful. Then we will look a bit more in detail at conditional independence and how to read it off or whether it's even possible in general to read off from a directed graph. And then later on in the lecture, I will introduce actually a second framework which is also a graphical way to write joint probability distributions but it's a slightly different kind of encoding. It's almost like a separate programming language in which um, under which certain other operations or certain operations are actually easier than under the directed graphical model framework but which also has its own downsides. And um, then we'll do a little bit of theory on a high level about the representational power of these uh, graphs. And in the next lecture I'll then also introduce actually a third framework for representing joint probability distributions which has again its uh, strengths and weaknesses. And the reason I do all of this is that in the remainder of this lecture 
I will want to use these graphical representations because we will now move to more complicated structured probabilistic models in which computational aspects become important and in which conditional independence plays a major role. To do so, we will need to use these graph graphical models, or actually we don't have to, but it's actually really useful to have them because they are an easy representation of uh, structure and I think that they should be in your toolbox as a mental aid to write down generative structure and conditional independence structure in your model so that you can think a bit more abstractly about what you're building and then maybe sometimes directly read off efficient algorithms from the structure of the graph. And the first thing I want to do is to introduce uh, or maybe to extend a little bit the notation of direct graphical models. This is really just for convenience. What I'm going to do is essentially a bit of syntactic sugar which is uh, going to be helpful later on when we build um, expressive models and I don't really know where else to introduce it in the course so I might as well do it here even though it's a little bit random here so that when the next time I start writing um, notation like this at least you know what I'm referring to. These are standard notations which are widely used by people who use graphical models to design probabilistic models. So the uh, first thing I'm going to introduce is a notion called a plate. A plate is a rectangle like this and what a plate represents is a copy of all the variables that are inside of it. So each plate has, is a rectangle that has a little number at the bottom and that number means that the indices in here, in this case the indices are i, um, run from 1 all the way to n and there are copies of the contents of this plate. So this graph here on the left hand side corresponds to this graph if you so far only look at the filled in, uh, sorry, at the, at the full circle variables because um, yi is copied n times. The second thing I'm going to introduce is something called a hyperparameter node. That those are these small black uh, circles. These correspond essentially to observed variables about um, which uh, we are don't, don't play a crucial role in the rest of the model, if you like. Uh, they're typically used to denote hyperparameters. And you can think of them basically as observed nodes. Observed nodes on which we uh, typically condition in a straightforward way, in an easy way we don't have to worry about so much. So this graph here on the right hand side represents the graph we need to encode the uh, structure of our Gaussian regression, parametric regression algorithm we've used in the past. So here you remember that we inferred uh, the, the, the latent, a latent function that is supposed to explain a data set of observations of a supervised problem with inputs x and outputs y by assuming that there is an iid, so conditionally independent evaluation of the function value at location xi with noise sigma. So that means, conditional independence here means that if you know what the latent function is, if you would know what the latent function is, then the individual observations are independent. So the individual observations are measurements of the true function made with Gaussian noise independently. And um, we put a Gaussian prior over the weights of this function. So the corresponding graph is, of course, let's write down the set of all variables y and w and assign circles, draw circles around them and then draw arrows going from the right hand side of a conditional distribution to the left hand side. So here there's a prior which has no right hand side so there's a w and then with the uh, conditional distributions for y given w are all independent so they are individual arrows pointing from w to all of the y's and no further arrows between the y's. In the, under this new sort of extended syntax, we can um, both expand, uh, more, make more expressive this graph by introducing all the variables that are a part of the model. We could even introduce a variable for phi as well, which I haven't done here, and uh, write them down. This can sometimes be really helpful because then you know where your variables enter, what their roles are, and uh, maybe like to, it, it might help you parse your code. 
And then I use this plate here to say that there are n copies of these. I should say probably maybe that um, this kind of notation, even though reasonably standard, is also not universally popular. So some people, for example, think that for certain applications it's not a good idea to draw these plates because they complicate your graph, they might uh, hide complicated structure inside. However, um, later on we will see models where it's really very difficult to get away without drawing a plate because uh, things just otherwise get really, really complicated and the graph is very difficult to parse. Okay, so that was it. I've introduced a bunch of notation and it was easy to do so because we haven't really used it yet. But so now don't be surprised if I start using hyperparameter nodes and plates to represent models. The next thing I want to do is to talk a little bit about conditional independent structure and what it actually takes to read that off. So in, the lecture, in lecture number two, we already encountered this table of conditional independent structure with three atomic independent structures. So I basically wrote down the first non-trivial set of, of graphs that turns out to be the graphs, the set of graphs that have three nodes. Because a graph with a single node is totally trivial, it's just a probability distribution. A graph with two nodes it's also, is also trivial because it's either disconnected, so then you have two independent variables, or it's connected and then the two variables are just dependent on each other and there is no conditional independent structure. But if you have three variables, then there are three different graphs you can write down. As you can see here, they are the chain graph, which we by now have seen used in um, Markov, Markovian time series uh, structured models. There is the, what you might call a fan out, or uh, sometimes also called a V structure uh, graph, where you have a parent that creates two child nodes. And thirdly, uh, what's called, what you might call a fan in or a collider structure, where there are two parents that um, create one child node. Now notice that all three of these graphs have the same order of variables. So really the only difference between these graphs is the direction of the arrows. And that's maybe like obvious when I say it, but it's also just important to remember that what makes these graphs interesting, what, what creates the structure and the encoding of conditional independence in here is the fact that these arrows have a direction. Otherwise, if you leave out a direction, then you can't encode, at least not in this framework, this kind of conditional independence. We'll get back to that in a few moments. So in lecture number two, we already like, manually, I actually did this on the whiteboard, went through and showed that the conditional, in, uh, sorry, that the, the factorization implied by this graphical notation implies certain conditional independent structure. So what I mean by that is that this graph is a graphical representation of this factorization structure. The fact that I write down this graph means that the joint distribution over A, B, and C is given by P of C given B, but not A, times P of B given A times P of A. And this graph means that the probability of A, B, and C is given by A given B, but not C, times C given B, times P of B. And this graph means that the joint distribution over A, B, and C is P of B given A and C times P of C not given A times P of A. Now, once you have this particular structure, you can then like, explicitly just go through and show that this factorization implies a particular conditional independence by marginalizing out or, even, or conditioning on particular variables. And we saw back then that this structure implies that A and C become independent of each other when we condition on B. So what we are seeing here is some kind of blockage, right? You can mentally think of if B is, if you condition on B, so if we fill in the variable B and make it black, then this chain becomes blocked and C becomes independent of A given B. But in general, when we marginalize out over B, A and C are actually dependent on each other under this model. In this case, we saw that, again, and I'm not going to redo the computations, but if you want to see them, check out lecture number two, that um, in, in, in this model, A is independent of C, actually the, similarly to uh, the chain graph, but if you marginalize out over B, A and C become dependent. And this graph is in some sense different, so under this model, A and C are independent in the marginal, but they become dependent when we condition on B in general. This feature or this kind of uh, yeah, like feature of probability theory maybe is called 
um, explaining away. And we observed it in the example with the burglary and the alarm. Once you get information that your alarm is ringing, you now suddenly have covariance between the two observations or codependence, dependence between the two observations, uh, sorry, between the two explanations for the alarm, burglary or earthquake. Because they can both create this observation, but it's quite unlikely that they are both true at the same time. Now, what I didn't address back then and what we should talk about now is of course the fact that these are very simple graphs. They just contain three different variables. Now uh, the natural question you might have is what happens if the graph has more than three variables? What if it has four, five or a higher number of nodes? How do I then reason about conditional independence in that graph? Well, it turns out that, that is, like, making this connection formal is possible but not particularly straightforward. And it requires the definition of a notion called de-separation that is due to Judea Pearl again. And um, I'm going to present it in a way that I've taken from the textbook by Chris Bishop, which I've mentioned in previous lectures as well. Actually, uh, significant parts of the presentation in this lecture are um, due to, well, in theory and from their, from, from their uh, genesis to Judea Pearl and also uh, other people like Stefan Lauritsen and David Spiegelhalter, but um, uh, in their presentation due to the book by Chris Bishop. So to um, encode this aspect, like, like to get a feeling for why it's non-trivial to think about um, how to read off conditional independence, let's look at these three examples again that we just had on the previous slides. Here are our three uh, graphs again. Now I've, I've actually changed the order of the variables, but other than that they are the same graphs. Now notice that in the, in the, on the previous slide we just saw, we just discussed that for these two graphs, so for the chain and the fan out, if we condition on this variable, which, we, which I now here call C, then the two other parts of the graph actually become independent of each other. And when we don't condition on it, then they become dependent on each other. However, for the third kind of graph, where the um, arrows are pointing inwards, the situation is in some sense reversed. So when we condition on it, then these two things become dependent, even though they are marginally independent of each other. So clearly, that means that we cannot just think of the graph and blockage in this graph without considering the direction of the arrows. We have to be careful to find rules that, that formalize the role of the direction of the arrows in making things conditionally independent of each other. And this is exactly encoded in this notion called D-separation, where D stands for directed separation um, by Judea Pearl. And I'll just kind of read it off because it's a little bit tedious to read. So consider a general directed acyclic graph, that's our graphical model, um, with three non-intersecting sets of nodes. So notice that we're talking about sets of nodes, not individual nodes. So you can think up here actually about sets of nodes as well. Now, um, and importantly, the union of these can be smaller than the complete graph. Like to ascertain whether the sets A and B are conditionally and independent of C, we need to consider all possible paths. So all possible paths means ways of traveling along the graph if you ignore the direction of the arrows from any node in A to any node in B. And now define a concept called blockage. A graph, such a path through the graph is considered blocked if it includes a node such that either the arrows on the path meet head to tail or tail to tail, so that's the situation here and there, at the node, and the node is in C, or the arrows meet head to head at the node and neither the node nor any its descendants is in C. Now there is a theorem, which is again due to the Pearl, that says if all paths between A and B are blocked, then A is said to be de-separated from B by C. And if that's the case, then A and B are conditionally independent of each other given C. So to see how tricky this uh, theorem really is, 
I have um, drawn here on my whiteboard a little graph which is actually taken as well from the book by Chris Bishop and it's a great example of how complicated the situation is. So here is a graph that contains an, in total five variables. Here is A and B. These are the ones we're going to be thinking about and they are connected to each other or they are part of a joint graph that involves also variables F and E and C. So let's think about the independence or conditional independence between A and B. And uh, under various or under conditioning on various sets of this graph. Now let's first assume that we're not conditioning on everything. Uh, on anything, sorry, we're not conditioning on anything. So let's look at the theorem which says we, to uh, ascertain whether A and B are independent of each other given some set, in this case the empty set, consider all possible paths between A and B. So there's only one possible path in this graph. It goes from A down, up and down again. So we now, according to the theorem, have to consider the variables along this path, so that's E and F, to think about whether A and B are independent of each other. And to do so we have to check for both variables whether uh, how, the, how the, 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 the arrows along this graph meet at these um, variables and then check whether that node or any of its descendants is in C. So let's first check F. So F is a tail-to-tail -tail node but the node is not in C. So there is no information that we are conditioning on, 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 on F. So we're not conditioning on F. So um, the first statement of D separation does not apply here. Let's look at E. E is a head-to-head -head node, and, um, but the node and none of its descendants are in C. Ah, okay. So that is the case of D separation. That's uh, statement number two, or the second way of getting D separation. So the fact that there is this variable here means that A and B are conditionally independent of each other. Well, conditional on nothing, right? So they are independent um, uh, by themselves. And this is just, so if you think about what, what this graph is supposed to imply in, self, in, in, in the sense of a generative model, you can probably convince yourself that that's true, right? So A is uh, involved in the generation of E, but B only depends on uh, F. And because the, there is no path uh, pointing upward here and we're not conditioning on any of these pieces of information, there's no reason why we know anything about B if you know something about A. So now let's assume that we observe the variable C. So that's supposed to be a filled in node. So now let's check again. So what I just said about F still holds, but if you now think about E, then E is now a, a node at which the arrows meet head to head, but not like itself, but is, is not in C, but one of its descendants, C, is in capital C, the set of variables we are conditioning on. So therefore, this path is now, let's say, unblocked. It's not blocked anymore because the second D separation criterion doesn't apply anymore. And we can actually not generally assume anymore that A and B are conditionally independent when conditioned on C. And again, intuitively, what's happening here is that by observing C, we are potentially learning something about E. Of course, that's not, it's not guaranteed that that's the case, but it could be the case. And that's all we're looking for. So um, once we know something about E, A and F become explained away. They are conditionally dependent because it's one of these collider structures. So now C might tell us something about the relationship between A and F. So therefore, by learning something about F, A would learn something about F, and then th therefore, naturally, also about B. Okay, so if you, if you condition on C, then A and B become potentially conditionally dependent on each other. And as a final case, if you condition on F, then F is still a tail-to-tail -tail node, but it's now in C. So therefore, it provides blockage and A and B are conditionally independent of each other, given F. Again, this is not surprising because F is directly generating B and F is not involved in the generation of A. So by learning something about A, we don't learn anything about B 
So this example has maybe shown how tricky this notion of de-separation is. We really have to be very carefully looking at the graph and thinking about these complicated rules of head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail uh, -tail and head-to-tail nodes and whether they are uh, in the set or not. So reading of conditional independence from a directed graph is not exactly an easy exercise if you want to do it by hand. You have to really stare at the graph and uh, apply the rules of de-separation. Nevertheless, you can imagine that these rules are sufficiently formal to allow for automated processes to check for conditional independence. And one particularly helpful concept to write such an algorithm that tests whether two variables are independent or conditionally independent is the set of all nodes you need to condition on to totally separate one variable from the rest of the graph. So which are the nodes you need to know such that the, a particular node in the graph becomes completely independent from everything else in the graph. Now that notion is called a Markov blanket. And it looks like this. So let me first, maybe first just give you the statement and then we can think about why it's true. So the Markov blanket is the node uh, of a particular node xi, so that's our variable in here in the graph, is the set of all parents, children, and co-parents of xi. And when we condition on that set, xi becomes independent of the rest of the graph. So conditionally independent of the rest of the graph. So why does that set look like it does? Why does it consist of all parents, children, and then co-parents of xi? Well, to do so, let's do a little bit of simple math. So um, let's consider the probability distribution. So let's, let's say we have a set of variables, uh, um, bold x, right? that's a vector of lots of variables, more than we have here in the picture potentially, one big graph, and they all depend on, uh, jointly together, uh, they, they all form one joint probability distribution. Now let's say we consider this one variable xi that we care about, and we condition on everything else. So conditioning on a variable, if it has an effect on xi, means that xi and xj are not independent of each other. So which set of variables do we have to condition on so that the rest of the variables actually don't matter anymore even if we condition on them? Now to do so, let's write down this conditional distribution. The conditional distribution is essentially Bayes' theorem, right? So it's a joint divided by the evidence, the normalization constant, and for that we have to integrate over xi. So now we use the graph. So whatever the graph structure is, this is like not necessarily just this graph, but basically any arbitrary graph, we know by definition of the graph that we can find this joint probability distribution in this form, where here I mean that this consists of terms in the factorization, which is represented by the graph, such that um, the, we, these are essentially just the, the, the individual sort of terms in the graph that you can read off from the graph. So for every variable, k, there is a set of parents that um, corresponds to the set of variables that, are, that have arrows pointing towards this variable. And those we can write down here. And these are easy to find because this is a directed acyclic graph. So for every variable, there's only an obvious set of, of parents that can just be read off from the graph by looking at the arrows. And then this together gives the joint probability distribution. Of course, there will be some variables in here which don't have parents, and then this notation is supposed to include those. Parents can be an empty set. So for example, this variable would have no parents. No, so now we have implement, implemented the graph or the information that is encoded in the graph. And now we just have to think about where xi actually shows up in here. What are the terms in this uh, expression where xi shows up. Well, so xi can show up in two different um, parts of such a factor, either on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. If it shows up on the left-hand side, then it's a child, and if it shows up on the right-hand side, then it's a parent. So what are the terms that contain xi? Well, they are the terms exactly that make up the Markov blanket. So xi can either be on the left-hand side, then it's um, involved in a set of terms that contain its parents, or it can be uh, contained in the right-hand side, then um, all variables that are its children might be on the left-hand side, 
and all co-parents might be with xi on the right hand side. So those are the terms that we cannot get rid of in this integral. So if we, if, when we do this integral down here in the, in the denominator, then we cannot move the integral through these terms because xi is somewhere in there, either on the left or on the right hand side. For all the other terms that don't involve xi, the integral sort of passes through and we can take these terms outside and then they are the same terms on the top and the bottom on the denominator and the, and the denominator of this fraction and therefore they cancel and we're left with just this expression. So no matter whether we are conditioning on variables or not, if they are outside of the, of the Markov blanket, they don't affect the marginal distribution over xi, assuming that we are also conditioning on the Markov blanket. So, Again, the Markov blanket is obviously a, a useful concept, a, a, a formal notion that can also be encoded and taught to a computer if you like. But it's again a little bit tedious, it's a little bit annoying because if to think about one variable xi, if you want to check whether it is conditionally independent of a set of variables given everything else, then that set of variables doesn't just have to contain all the nodes which are connected to xi by an, a, a line, right, an arrow pointing in either one or the other direction. But we also have to check for all of the children of xi what their co-parents are and whether we are also conditioning on those as well. So this property to taken together with that of deseparation maybe gives you a feeling for why directed graphs are perhaps not the ideal tool if the, the concept you're interested in is conditional independence. They are a great tool though if you just want to write down a generative model. So with that, we're at a gray slide. Directed graphical models are one kind of model. In a moment, I'm going to introduce a second one, which reflect uh, directly the factorization of a probability distribution. You can read off, I mean, you can, if you have a factorization of a probability distribution, so something that looks like this, where the joint probability distribution over x, a and b can be written like this, you know that this is the case, then you can directly translate it into a graph. You just write down all the variables, a, b and x, draw circles around them and then draw arrows for every term in the factorization pointing from the right hand side of the factor to the left hand side of the factor. This is really convenient because there is this direct map between factorization and graph. But there's another concept that we care about, which is actually was for, for many, in many ways the main reason why I initially introduced these graphs, which is conditional independence, because that has a strong computational effect. Now, conditional independence can actually be read off from the graph, but with a few caveats. The first caveat, which is particularly, uh, well, the first caveat is maybe an easier one. Let's start with the easier one, which is a more, maybe more of a nuisance which is that reading of conditional independence as encoded by the graph requires using the notion of deseparation and or the, mark, the, the Markov blanket which are sufficiently formal to be encoded in an algorithm but they are also a little bit tedious to use by hand. So if you want to use these graphs to write them on a blackboard or a whiteboard and then think about a conditional independence implied by the graph, then that can be a little bit tedious because you have to think about notions of head-to-head um, uh, -head and tail-to-tail -tail and head-to-tail nodes and whether it's sets of children con uh, are, are uh, contained in the set that you're conditioning on and sets of parents and co-parents. You can still do that though, but it's not ideal for a notation that's supposed to be used by hand as well. But there's a bigger problem, which is that given a particular probability distribution, not every conditional independent structure can be read off from the graph. So each graph encodes a certain, like certain sets of conditional independences, but there are joint probability distributions which have conditional independent structure that cannot be simultaneously represented in a single graph. So at this point, we see that directed graphs are a useful tool, something you might want to use to write down, given that you have a factorization, a representation of your, of your generative model, to think about it, to analyze it, 
to maybe even identify interesting computational aspects, but they are not perfect. And now the question that arises, of course, is, is there an, another way to write graphs that is in some other sense beneficial? Ideally, of course, it would fix all of these problems. And we'll see how hard it is to do so. Now, what you might be asking yourself is, maybe, maybe can we just turn the definition around? So directed graphs were defined from the factorization property. So you, if you take a, a joint distribution and you have a factorization, then you can read off the graph. Now we saw that conditional independence is then difficult to read off from that graph. So maybe we can do things the other way around. Can we define the graph through its conditional independence directly and then wonder about factorization later? Well, it turns out that that's possible. And before I show you how it works, Maybe let's look at this graph again and think about what made thinking about conditional independence so tricky in this graph. It was the fact that we had to keep track of uh, situations of this phenomenon of explaining away. And explaining away arises if you make observations of variables which are at these kind of colliders uh, uh, structures. So variables that are the children of several parents. So really the problem here is that these graphs have these arrows. Because if they didn't have arrows, then, the then we, didn't, we wouldn't have to separate between collider and fan out and chain structures, and they would all just be the same, right? If, we, if you didn't have directions to these arrows. So that's exactly the idea that leads to what's called an undirected graphical model. Undirected graphical models are, are also known as Markov random fields, and they, they arise essentially from, at least for us, from the idea of let's just write down a graph structure that directly reflects conditional independence. So here's a formal definition. An undirected graph, that's just a very, I mean, that's just an undirected graph. An undirected graph is just a collection of, of uh, vertices and nodes, right? So um, circles and edges between them. Now, such a graph, of course, you can write down such a graph, and now we will call such a graph a Markov random field if we decide to interpret the edges as implying conditional independence in the following sense. So such a graph is called a Markov random field if for any subsets within the set of vertices and a separating set, which is also a set of vertices, and that's a set such that every path between A and B has to pass through that set, a and B become conditionally independent where, um, when conditioned on XS. This is called the global Markov property. So what does that look like? Here is such a graph. Um, this is again a graph that I've taken from Chris Bishop's book, even though I've rearranged the notes a little bit. And um, so what, notice that this graph now doesn't have arrows anymore. It just has edges. It's an undirected graph. So, so far, it's just, an, it's just a set of vertices and edges. But if I say this is a Markov random field, if I treat this as a Markov random field, then this means that these individual variables, these individual uh, uh, symbols that are inside of the circles are interpreted as random variables. So as uh, uh, things that we assign probability distributions over. And the edges are supposed to mean that when we condition on a separating set, then two sets become independent of each other. So let's in particular consider the set A and B. So here are three nodes and here are two nodes. Then um, this set four and five is a separating set because every path between A and B that you can try has to pass through the separating set. Now you can immediately notice that one nice thing about this kind of formulation is that you can make all sorts of fun theoretical statements or analyses. So for example, you can, you can ask, is there another separating set between A and B? Normally I ask these questions in the lecture and then people can have a discussion with me, so you'll have to have that discussion with yourself. For example, you might then notice that, yes, we could include one in the separating set, and then it would be a, a larger separating set, but that sort of seems unnecessary, right? Separating sets should be as small as possible. So is there a smaller separating set than S to separate these two groups from each other? Well, no. If we remove five, then there is a path that connects them. If we take one, even if we take one and four, and if we take one and five, so we remove four, then of course there is a connecting path as well. 
And you can also question, make questions about what are, given this separating set, what is the largest set of variables that are separated from each other? Well, it's not A and B because we can include one in here and then this would be a th set of three variables that are separated from each other. This global Markov property implies a simpler thing, a weaker statement that's called the pairwise Markov property. Any two nodes, U and V, that don't share an edge are conditionally independent given each, all other variables. Of course, because if they don't share an edge, then to get from one to the other, you have to pass through another variable. And if you condition on that variable, then clearly it, um, that, that path is blocked. So that means that for these undirected graphs for Markov random fields, the definition of a Markov blanket is actually much, much easier, if you like, than in the directed set. The Markov blanket for a Markov random field is literally just the set of neighbors of Xi. So neighbors are all variables which share an edge with a particular variable. When we condition on this blanket, then it, uh, Xi becomes independent of the entire rest of the graph. So notice how easy it was to define Markov random fields and that's maybe one of the biggest appeals of this, of this representation. It's, it can, can be defined in, well, I mean, that's essentially just one line if I wouldn't have to make this, uh, uh, this block here so small. So it, they're easy to define. And as we already saw, by their definition, just by writing down what a Markov random field is, we've already ensured that reading of conditional independence structure is extremely easy in Markov random fields. And that was maybe the quickest gray slide we earned ourselves in this lecture course so far. Just two slides to define what a, a Markov random field is and then immediately see that the Markov blanket is really easy to see. So here we have a representation that is obviously more powerful or more useful than directed graphs if all we care about is conditional independence structure. Now remember that for directed graphs, we defined the, the notation the other way around. We first, we defined it from the factorization property. So we took the joint distribution, which factorizes in certain ways, and then used that to define the graph. And then reading of conditional independence was hard. So here now, we've, de we've devised a notation, Markov random fields, in which reading of conditional independence is easy. But to do so, we dropped the direction of arrows so therefore, it's going to be tricky to think about the joint distribution. So to rephrase the question, in directed graphs, I can directly read off factorization. If you give me a directed graph, I can take it and read off what the factorization, at least one factorization, of the joint probability distribution is. But then I have to pay the price for that, that reading of conditional independence structure is a little bit tedious. It's not impossible, but it's a bit tedious. So now in undirected graphs, I can actually read off conditional independent structure directly. That's a great part of this definition. But what about factorization? Well, it turns out that reading off factorization is much harder because I don't have the directions on the graph anymore and um, therefore can't directly separate the graph into individual parts which have a left and a right hand side. So if you give me an undirected graph, what could the factors look like that we're looking at? And to um, answer that question, let me go back two slides. And remind you of this pairwise Markov property. Any two nodes in the graph that don't share an edge are conditionally independent given all the other variables. So that provides us with like, being conditionally independent means it means that, that they are, they are conditional distributions factorized. So that tells us something about factorization. Here we go again. So any two nodes that aren't connected by an edge have to be conditionally independent given the rest of the graph. Thus, the joint has to factorize at least in the following way. So if we think about the probability distribution over two particular variables that don't share an edge when conditioned on the entire rest of the graph. So by here, by this notation, I mean the set of all nodes in the graph that doesn't contain the two nodes i and j then that distribution has to separate, it has to factorize into two terms. So therefore, nodes that don't share an edge can't be in the same factor, right? Because um, they are either 
on the left hand side that so if they don't share an edge then their joint distribution looks like this and they that means they don't uh, t turn up on the left uh, um, on the left so the, the variable j does not show up on the left hand side of this factor nor on the right hand side of this factor so for any two nodes that don't contain an edge or they don't share an edge there has to be a factor or two separate factors such that each node individually is a part of only one of these factors. So what kind of factors in our joint probability distribution does that leave us with? So normally at this point I ask people to think about this and maybe you should for a second as well. So remember that we're trying to make as many factors as, po as possible. Factorization is a good thing if you have many different factors then that simplifies computation. So our goal should be to try and make the factors small so that we have like the set of variables that are in factors small so that we have as many factors as possible. So how small can we make a factor? Imagine, let's look at this graph down here, imagine that we have um, that we consider these two variables, or let's say these two, one and two. So these share an edge, so therefore they have to be in a factor together, right? Because this statement up here says if uh, something is not connected by an edge. So if it is connected by an edge, then of course it's the, the two variables are dependent on each other, given, even given everything else, because they directly affect each other. So maybe we could wonder whether we could make a factor that just contains nodes one and two. But notice that there's also variable x3, which happens to be connected both to x1 and to x2. So it has to be in the same factor because it, um, well, it directly also affects the two. So what kind of factors does that leave us with? Well, it leaves us with factors that are at the very least consist of all sets of nodes such that within those sets all variables are connected densely with each other and the such sets are called cliques. So in a graph a clique is a subset of the vertices of the graph such that there exists an edge between all pairs of nodes in C. A maximal clique is a clique such that it's impossible to include any other nodes from V without it ceasing to be a clique. So if you look at our graph here again then you can ask yourself for a moment what are the cliques of this graph? Maybe the first thing you will notice is that all pairwise sets of nodes are cliques, as I just also pointed out, but those are not maximal cliques. These are not uh, because they are um, for any of these variables actually you can, if you take two uh, in this particular graph, right, if you take a, a pair, then you can add a third variable and make it a, a, a larger clique. So in particular, here we go, um, variables two and three and four, and by the way this is a graph again from Chris Bishop, um, uh, two and three and four are, are a maximal clique. Why, why are they maximal? Well because if you add one then um, one is not connected to four, this is not a fully connected graph and therefore it's not a clique anymore. So that means we can make a factor out of two and three and four. Why is not one not in there? Well because there is a separating set two and three. So if you condition on two and three, then one becomes independent of four. And that means that in our factorization, there has to be a factor which contains only the variables two and three and one, so that when we condition on two and three, one becomes independent of four. Now, um, another thing maybe to notice is that, of course, this red thing that I've outlined here, that's not the only maximal clique. There is another one which includes x1, x2, and x3. So our factorization has to contain at least two factors, one, no sorry, it has to contain two factors, not at least, um, one with, that includes x1, x2 and x3, and one which, exclu which includes x2, x3 and x4. And it might contain additional factors that uh, contain only two and three, but of course that doesn't really help us for uh, further factorization because there is also a factor with two and three and four. On the subsequent slide, I'm going to use the letter capital C to denote the set of all maximal cliques of the graph. So by this argument we've just gone through, any distribution P of X, which is represented by a Markov random field, G, 
can be written as a factorization over all the cliques and therefore also just over all maximal cliques because as I just said it doesn't really help us if we include individual factors for just the cliques because they don't simplify the computation further because there will be a maximal clique which actually dominates the computational cost. And we can therefore just look at the maximal cliques because any clique is a part of at least one maximal clique. So by this argument we now know that if you give me an undirected graph, a Markov random field, then I can go through this graph, find all the maximal cliques, and, and then know that whatever the joint probability distribution over all the variables x is, it has to be possible to write that joint probability distribution in this form. So it has to be a product of individual terms, let's call them terms for a moment, they are actually called potential functions, such that these potential functions, these terms, only contain variables or they only depend on variables that are within this particular maximal clique and then we multiply over all such maximal cliques. And then there is this, I had to write an, a, a constant in front, why is that? Well, this has to do with the fact that I only really know that there are functions of this form. So remember that for directed graphs, if I could read off from the graph that these individual terms and the factorization are conditional distributions and I knew which part, like which variable in, um, in this uh, set of, ent of uh, inputs to this function played the role of a right hand side, so a variable that we condition on in the conditional distribution and which variable played the role of a child, so a left hand side of the conditional distribution. I knew that because the graph had arrows, directed edges, so we can just look at whether an, an, an arrow ends in a variable or it begins in a variable. If a variable is involved in a factor by, with, through an arrow that begins at a variable, then it has to be on the right hand side of this factor. And if it's involved in a factor by, through an arrow that ends on the right hand side, uh, sorry, that ends at that variable, then it has to be on the left hand side of this factorization. It has to be a child. Now in undirected graphs we don't have arrows, so we don't know whether a variable is on the left or right hand side of a conditional distribution. But remember that conditional distributions are only probability distributions of their left hand side. Right? P of x given y is only a probability distribution of x, not of y. We've spoken several times about the fact that likelihoods are not probability distributions of their right hand side. If you remember when we did linear regression, I plotted the likelihood factors in the uh, weight space in the very first time we did linear regression. And we saw that those likelihoods are not probability distributions as a function of their right hand sides, which like back then were the weights. So therefore, w even though the graph tells us that it has to be possible to factorize the, fa the joint probability distribution in this way, we don't know that these potential functions are probability distributions of any particular variable in here or all of them together because some of the variables in this clique might play the role in this uh, pot potential function of a variable to condition on and others might play the role of a variable that is actually we actually define a probability over. So we simply know that these are functions which have to be um, non-negative because they do define probability distributions and for simplicity, that's actually a really strong simplification that I will talk about in uh, two slides from now. Um, uh, we will assume that the, they are actually all strictly positive. Now, if you remember the, the, um, like the Gaussian examples we've done so far are actually all of that form. Of course, you can think, think of other situations where there is actually a choice of some of the variables x. Uh, in xc such that this becomes strictly zero. But we'll just ignore those because they dr drastically complicate the analysis. So because we don't know which variables are left and right hand side of probability distributions or conditional probability distributions, we also don't know the normalization constant. That's again different from the directed graph and it's the reason why I need to include this constant z in here. Because this left hand side is a probability distribution of course, but we don't know that those uh, right hand sides are, uh, which part of them are probability distributions. In a directed graph, if you tell me what the factors are in the graph, then because I know what the order is of the variables in them, I directly know that I have a factorization according to the sum rule of the probability distribution, P of X on the left hand side, and therefore I'm done. On the right hand side, I don't. 
And that's a problem. Why? Because people use these graphs to say, I want to write down a probability distribution, a joint probability distribution, which has a following factorization property. That's why an undirected graph is, is interesting, because it directly allows you to encode conditional independent structure. So they would write down terms, factors, potentials, that um, enter into a function like this. But because we only know what these potentials are going to be as uh, local entries of their, of their neighbors, we don't know what the global normalization constant is going to be because we never write down a joint generative model, at least um, not in general, that is directly an, uh, a probability distribution. And therefore, these partition functions have to be computed. These, are, these normalization constants are also called partition functions in this framework. And um, that can potentially be very hard because we need the normalization over this entire expression. Now, because a variable can be a member of several maximal cliques, as we saw in this example here, so two, for example, x2 is a member of both the red maximal clique and the other one that goes to x1, x2, and x3, we cannot generally put this integral inside of any of the factors of this, uh, of this factorization. And so we have to do it over the entire space, essentially. And that's extremely hard. Again, it's combinatorially hard, as we've already discussed several times. So I said that we're going to assume that the potential terms are going to be strictly larger than zero, even though, of course, they don't necessarily have to be just based on being a Markov random field. And you might have wondered why I said that. Well, the, to cut to the chase, the simple answer is that if psi is strictly larger than zero, then we can think of these individual potential functions in this factorization as the exponentials of something, because the exponential function maps from the real line to the strictly positive real numbers. And then this p of x is the product of exponential functions or the exponential of a sum, um, which is an idea that is connected to also one of the origins of Markov random fields, physics. And it's connected with the names of these two chaps, the Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann and the American physicist Josiah Gibbs. So these actually, uh, Markov random fields arose in physics as a model for uh, the, the statistics of thermodynamical systems through interaction terms between individual particles, which you can think of as potentials. Right? So a potential defines the interaction term. That's also why these terms are called potential functions. And um, so maybe here, here's just a math, right? So if we do this, if, if we assume that our potential functions are strictly positive, then we can think of them as the exponential of some term. And that term like, traditionally in physics has the form of the exponential of minus some energy because systems try to uh, minimize their energy. So they become particularly likely if they have a low energy. And um, if our Markov random field is of this form, that it can be written as, well, actually, if it's, if our Markov random field, which is of this form, contains potential functions which are only strictly positive, then we can think of them as the exponential of a sum over the individual components, right? Why a sum? Because they are the product of the potential functions, and each potential is an exponential. So the total distribution is the exponential of a sum, a product of exponentials and a normalization constant, which we can add here. And uh, that, again, there's a minus missing. This should be called minus log z. Sorry about that. And now we might as well introduce individual scaling factors, wc. You could either think of them as being all one if we set ec that way, or you could say they have a value that is given by some kind of count. So in physics, this is often a count of how many particles are in that particular energy level, if there are discrete numbers of energy levels. So it's a kind of a state sum of how many particles are in there. Such distributions are called Boltzmann distributions, uh, historically ORS or the associated probability measure. If it exists, it's called a Gibbs measure. These, um, uh, so, well, yeah, a Gibbs measure is something like this, right? So it has exactly, exactly this kind of form, where E is known the energy, is called, called the energy. Why am I showing you this? Well, I could have a do, do a detour here about physics and maybe just point out that uh, Markov random fields are historically connected to physics. But what's maybe more interesting is the connection to our previous lecture. So this connection here provides a little bit of a teachable moment. Notice that this function is really an exponential function. 
So any such Gibbs measure, and I'm already claiming that it's any Markov random field, but of course I haven't really like, argued that yet, um, is of a form of an exponential family. It's an exponential of a sum over individual energies, where the energies are the logarithm of the potential functions. So they are, if you like, our sufficient statistics times some weights, which are the natural parameters, minus a log normalization constant. Now, that sounds exciting because we just had this last lecture where we saw that we can learn probability distributions uh, as exponential families. So if you get draws from a distribution, you can learn that distribution if it's, if it's an exponential family using maximum uh, likelihood type inference. And then doing so is easy because it separates into, uh, it basically turns into just computing the gradient of the log normalization. Ah, here's our problem, right? So I just said on the previous slide that Z is actually the tricky thing to compute. So in a sense, Boltzmann distributions are sort of this, like the opposite side of, the, of the, the power of exponential family distributions. So they are of the same algebraic form, they are exponential families, but whereas in the previous lecture, I argued that if you know the log normalization constant, then computing expected values of the sufficient statistics is particularly easy because all you have to do is to compute the gradient of the log normalization constant. Here we now see sort of the, the flip side of this coin, which is that if you don't know the log normalization constant, then to learn it, you have to compute the expected values of all of these sufficient statistics, all the energies under this distribution. And that's of course tricky to do because it's a very high dimensional integral. In particular, because these variables, just to repeat what I said on the previous slide, um, come from these cliques and the cliques might be overlapping. So in general, you might have to do an integral over the entire space to, um, to do compute this log normalization constant. Now, what I have only hinted at so far and I really just sort of, sort of said in a very hand wavy sense, which is that we can, we can think of these Markov random fields with their cliques as Boltzmann distributions, so as if you like exponential family distributions or as Gibbs measures, actually is a formal statement that um, has a name. It's called the Hammersley Clif Clifford theorem. Um, so I'm not gonna do it, um, I'm not gonna do a proof because it's actually a really non-trivial kind of statement. Uh, you, as you can guess probably if it has such a complicated name uh, associated with two different people. Um, but I'm gonna just say that. So this is basically a formalization of um, uh, the very hand wavy argument I just made. So if you have uh, potentials that are strictly larger than zero, then you can uh, think of them as exponentials of, um, of, of energy functions. It turns out that um, there's actually a more formal direct connection between the two and here it is. So if you consider the set of all possible strictly positive distributions, so again, we're assuming that we're strictly positive, defined over a undirected graph, then this, this, the uh, conditional independences that can be read off from the graph when interpreted as a Markov random field are equal to the distributions that can be expressed as a Gibbs measure with the factorization that I had on here. So let me show it to you again. So, that's sort of several steps wrapped into one. First of all, maybe let's go a bit slow again. So if you consider the subset of all distributions that are consistent with the conditional independences that can be read off from G using the graph. So that is actually a step before that. We're saying if we use um, these properties, right? So if you use these conditional independence structures, then what I've done in the last few minutes is I've gone through and said, oh, okay, then we can think of these Markov uh, uh, blankets and then therefore probably think of these kind of cliques and then means, ah, we can probably think of potentials as cliques. And um, uh, then um, if they're strictly positive, then they're obviously Boltzmann um, distributions or Gibbs measures. Well, you can do this sort of on the other direction as well. This proof, you can say the, um, uh, if you consider the set of all distributions that can be expressed as a Gibbs measure with the factorization in star. So if you can think of a function that is of this form, a probability measure of this form, then the set of all functions, uh, of all probability measures that can be expressed in this form with this factorization is actually equal to 
the set of all distributions that are consistent with the conditional independences using the, uh, that can be read off from the graph. So in that sense, Markov random fields, the graphical model, and the um, thermodynamical framework of writing down a Gibbs measure make a connection to between symbolic and mathematical language, or it's, uh, you know, drawing, arrow, uh, drawing undirected graphs and writing exponential functions. Okay, so that's an abstract statement. There is actually also a much more direct way to construct uh, Markov random fields, so undirected graphical models, in the specific case of Gaussian distributions. And I would, that's the bit that I would like to end with uh, in this lecture. So just to remind you of the content of the lecture number, I think it was six, on the first properties of Gaussian distributions, actually it might, might have been five. Um, there we did this uh, humble Gaussian analysis that uh, David Mackay uh, produced a while ago and observed that, or maybe just studied the meaning of the terms in covariance matrices of Gaussian distributions. So like then we saw that if you have a joint distribution over random variables that is jointly Gaussian with a mean and a covariance matrix, then you can read off marginal and conditional independent statements quite directly from the, um, the Gaussian distribution, from, 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 sorry, from the covariance matrix sigma. In particular, and that's not even on this slide, but let me just reiterate it, if there is a zero in an off-diagonal element of the covariance matrix at entry ij, then that means that the variables xi and xj are marginally independent. So they are independent when integrating out all other variables. The perhaps more exciting, more intricate statement is if uh, is a statement about the zero in the inverse covariance matrix. So if uh, you consider the matrix that is the inverse of this uh, positive, hopefully positive definite matrix sigma, and there is a zero on its ij of diagonal element, then that zero means that xi and xj are conditionally independent when conditioned on all the other variables. By the way, of course, this allows us also to uh, make more general statements about the uh, conditional independence our, under a subset of other variables. Maybe convince yourself at this point how you would do that in the Gaussian framework because marginalization is so easy in the Gaussian framework. So to consider whether two variables i and j are conditionally independent given any specific subset of the other variables within the uh, vector x, first compute the marginal over all the variables that you don't want to condition on. So to do that, you just select a subset of the covariance matrix and the mean of the corresponding variables that you don't want to integrate out. Right? That's very easy for Gaussians. And then check whether there is still a zero on the off-diagonal um, entry for these two variables that we want to consider. And if there now still is a zero, then you're conditionally independent. These two variables are conditionally independent given only that subset that remains in this marginal. Why does this work? It works because the inverse of a subset of a matrix is not the subset of the inverse of a matrix. Inversion is a nonlinear operation that doesn't uh, keep, like doesn't exchange under these, un under these two operations or doesn't exchange with the operation of subset selection and marginalization in Gaussian distributions. Okay, but so let's say we've already marginalized over all of the variables that we don't want to condition on and we want to just see whether xi and xj are conditionally independent given everything else, then we can just read that off from the corresponding off-diagonal element of the inverse covariance matrix. Now that means that if we can read off this property, it also means we can directly write the graph. Because as we've seen on previous slides, if two variables are not conditionally independent when conditioned on everything else, that means they have to share an edge. Why? Because of, let me go back, show you the Markov blanket again, because of this property of um, Markov random fields. Their Markov blanket is given by all the direct neighbors. So if, or actually even more generally, um, the definition of the set itself, right? So if we have condition on all other variables, and um, 
actually it's down here, the pairwise Markov property. If you've conditioned on all, other on all other variables in the set and the two variables are still not independent, then this statement must be false. So therefore, they have to share an H, right? That's the only explanation. So that means if we have a Gaussian distribution, then we can write the associated Markov random field quite directly. We just take the, uh, we just draw a variable for all, uh, for all entries in X, so that's just a bunch of circles. Then we take the covariance matrix of our Gaussian, we invert it, and we check for all zero entries in the, uh, in the covariance matrix. And if there's, uh, for all non-zero entries, we just draw edges between Xi and Xj, and that directly gives us our graph. Yeah, and with that, we're actually at the end of today's lecture. So um, today's lecture was a preparation for a notation that we're going to use in subsequent lectures. We first returned to the notion of directed uh, graphical models, Bayesian networks that are already introduced abstractly or maybe very briefly in lecture number two, where we saw that these uh, graphs can be constructed directly from factorizations of joint probability distributions. If you have a factorization, you can write it down into, into a directed graphical model by uh, drawing a circle for every variable that, you, that is in the model and then drawing an edge, an arrow, for every term in the factorization where the right-hand side of the factor is the beginning of the arrow and the left-hand side of the factor is the end of the arrow. So that's a generative model. This is a beautiful language and we saw that one maybe a somewhat tedious aspect is that of course you want to use these, these uh, one reason why you want to use these graphical models is to infer conditional independent structure and doing so is actually possible in a formal sense um, using the notion of deseparation. That was a little bit tedious to do because it required looking at not just parents and children of variables but also at co-parents because of the phenomenon of explaining away. So perhaps you might wonder, um, or we wondered for sort of the sake of argument at least, is there a way to write down graphical models which, uh, or a variant of graphical models, another graphical notation, which doesn't have this sort of complication in which we can directly read off conditional independent structure. Now it turns out that this is actually possible and it's realized in the notion of undirected graphical models which are also known as Markov random fields which are more or less dis defined to have by through that property. So you uh, draw a graph such that when conditioned on, um, all, uh, on, on a subset of the nodes variables that are separated by that subset become conditionally independent. That means that you can directly of a read of conditional independence from such graphs However, as we now discovered, there is a massive downside to that, which is that the reading of the joint distribution is now much harder to do and requires a potentially combinatorially expensive computation, at least to get the normalization constant right. Given that, of course, you might wonder why anyone would want to use a Markov random field over a directed graphical model if it's that much harder to compute with this. Well, to understand where these two models come from, also historically, think about what, it, what you need to know to write one of these models. So for a directed graph, you need to know the joint probability distribution over all the variables involved, that's a full generative model, and then you can write down the directed graph. At least that's sort of the natural thing to, write, to then write down because you have these terms that are conditional probability distributions, so they naturally lend themselves to directed connections with the left and the right hand side. To write down a mark of random field, all you need to know is the potential functions. And then once you have potential functions, you can, like, if you are in a situation where you know the potential functions, then you can write down the graph by essentially creating variables for all of the individual, uh, all the variables, well, creating variable nodes for all the variables in your model, and then drawing cliques for in each individual potential function. So by connecting all the variables that um, f densely th uh, into a clique that uh, show up in each individual potential function. So that of course gives you an idea for where these models come from. Historically this is an idea from physics where you know what the potentials are. The potentials are given by interaction terms between particles for example or uh, moving bodies 
and uh, through, through potentials, right? Of course, you can also decide to simplify those potentials to remove certain interaction terms and make certain simplifications, and then the, they directly inform your graphical model. On the other hand, directed graphs um, have a history from, from statistics, or at least at least are popular in statistics, where you have a full generative model, you have make assumptions about how all the variables relate to each other, not just a small subset of particles. And, um, and then what you want to know is everything you can know about all of these variables given a subset of these variables. So you want to do inference. For example, you might have a, a description of a medical process, decision process that involves various different symptoms and uh, treatments and the outcome of certain diagnostical tools to, or symptoms to inform about uh, what kind of um, disease a patient is uh, suffering from. So directed graphs are in some sense, at least for our purposes, maybe the more powerful model because if we have a generative model, we can write it down directly and um, the graph, because it has direction, is more expressive and in particular it allows us to read off um, conditional independence more or less in an automated fashion from the graph while for an undirected graph, even though we can read off the conditional independence structure directly, reading off the joint probability distribution is a much harder process. So the typical application for directed graphs is, today at least, is uh, twofold. So people use directed graphs for in basically two different modes. One is as a mental tool to write down something on a whiteboard or a blackboard to study how a distribution looks like. We're actually going to do this in subsequent lectures. And perhaps more promising, more exciting direction, which is also recently gaining more momentum, is the fact that once you have a graph, you can do automated inference. You can automatically construct conditional independent structure, maybe use that to inform the algorithms that you might use to do inference on. This is a one key concept at the heart of the sort of developing domain of probabilistic programming. What we need to do in the next lectures is to refine this graphical language a little bit further so that both the abstract sort of mathematical work of writing on a whiteboard and the automated process of operating on such graphs becomes more flexible and powerful. Maybe we'll also talk a little bit more about the connections between these uh, then emerging different um, frameworks of uh, graphical models and how to map from one model to the next. And that will give rise to an actually quite powerful generic algorithm that um, directly takes account of the structure in a graph to uh, create relatively efficient, in some sense, automated inference in graphical models. But that's for later. For now, thank you very much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. I'm looking forward to see you in the next one.